Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. Good, good, good. good. Uh, well, hello, everybody. I'm uh, Paul Ferris. I'm a former pinball artist and uh, art teacher. And I'm going to take a little trip through memory lane here with, with me today, talking about not pinball art so much in general, but just the artwork that I got a chance to work on over the years. And I, I did it for uh, 26 years as a uh, pinball artist and uh, illustrator. And I was, one time I was the art director at Bally. And, there's a lot of um, interesting stories that go with it. Um, I'm going to try to just go through some of the, the, the uh, games that I've done. Um, the, if, as I see the slides, I'll be reminded of some stories that will come up. And I may have, if anybody has seen me talk before, they may have seen some of these slides and, seen, and heard some of the stories. But <clears throat> I've added some new things this year, and hopefully um, we'll get to that too. So, and at the end, I would like to open it up for some questions. If anybody has questions they'd like to ask or um, uh, or anything specifically you want to ask me about. So the first one, why, why in the world do I have a picture up here of a um, wrestler and a wrestling coach? The wrestling coach is me, and this is 1975. And this is kind of when the pinball star story actually started, but I, I need to mention that I, in my, most of my life, looking back on it, I've had um, two major passions in my life. And one of them is art, and the second one has been wrestling. And so the entire time I've talked I talked to you about the, the pinball games and other, other artwork I've done. Um, during, except for four years of that time, I was also a wrestler or wrestling coach. So not a, a very usual combination of disciplines, but um, it had a huge impa impact on my life. So um, this, this particular uh, picture is actually um, in 1975 when I was in the state championship match. My, my wrestler was in the state championship match in Illinois. And um, so that's kind of where things started. <clears throat> and then at, that, at this time, um, I was doing, I was a, an art teacher, wrestling coach, and a uh, fine artist. I would do uh, paintings of children, of landscapes, and I would go to art fairs and to galleries and sell my paintings um, that way. And um, this particular painting um, has not been sold. It's actually my, to my oldest children, my um, daughter and my oldest son. Um, we still have that painting, and this is, um, you know, from, like I said, from 1975. So, um, and this is sort of typical of what I was doing at the time, the type of paintings I was selling, and, and um, the type of artist I th thought of myself as being. I was a fine artist. I was doing, um, you know, trying to be a very serious artist as, I, as well as teach. But I had this coaching um, occupation as well, and that was a, took a major part of my life as well. It was very, very rewarding and enjoyable. Um, but during this time, I received a phone call from my brother, and uh, he had run into Bill O'Donnell Jr., who, if anybody knows the history of, of Bally, that Bill O'Donnell Jr. was the um, son of the president of Bally at the time. And <clears throat> he was looking for someone to come in and do, become an, an artist at Bally and kind of add to Dave Christensen's work, which, which was he was doing some phenomenal work, um, and he wanted somebody else that could come in and do the similar types of work or very more realistic type of uh, pinball art. And, um, and also then set up an art department so Bally could have their own in-house art department. Because at the time, all pinball art, which of course all the pin pinballs were manufactured in Chicago, and I think most of you know that, um, but all the artwork was done by one company called Advertising Poster. And um, Bill O'Donnell had this vision of trying to create a department so that Bally could have its own specific look, its own style to the game, so it would be unique. And so he wanted someone to come in and do the artwork uh, along with Dave, and then also hire more artists to create a, a full-time art department. Um, so um, I, at first, I, my reaction to that idea, I did talk to Bill on the phone, but I just didn't think I would be interested. I, you know, I was a fine artist. You know, I had this attitude. I have no idea what pinball art was even like. I, um, in Chicago, they were illegal, so we couldn't even you know, see them to play them. Um, so I really didn't know much about it. I, did, I, I went in and talked to them, um, said I would think about it. Anyway, over, over a few weeks, I, I considered it, and my wife's an accountant, and she talked to me about it and said, this is you know, kind of a, maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. This is a company that's growing. They want, your, they want what you do. So um, I did take the, uh, the offer and went to work for, for Bally in 1970. Well, actually the beginning of 76, so, um, and that's when I started doing pinball art. And um, it was, and I'll never regret it. It was the greatest decision. My wife gave me good advice. Um, I, I come to a show like this and see how, 
how enthused people are about pinball and see the resurgence in pinball and um, not just art, but the whole pinball experience is wonderful. So, um, and I became a, um, a believer in pinball after I went to Bali. So, um, so this is a picture of pretty early on. Um, you might recognize um, I, uh, the background paint, uh, the, the, the painting in the background that I'm working on. Um, obviously it's a stage photo because I'd already finished it, but, um, but that is uh, Paragon, which is, is a little bit further down the line chronologically from um, where, I, where I started, but it was um, just kind of gives you an idea what, you know, what, what the world was like for me at that time. So I, um, uh, I'm going to move on to the next one. This is, this is a little postcard I give out um, to when I sign autographs and things for um, pieces that um, kind of represent a, a kind of a cross section of some of the games I've done, and it's over my the entire career. So it goes all the way back to a game like Eight Ball, which was um, at one time was a, the highest selling pinball game of all time up until um, Adam's family finally eclipsed their record. But um, and then um, all the way down to I think the most recent one on that sheet is the Golden Eye James Bond painting. So that covers about you know 25 years I think. Um, and there's some other ones on there were they're kind of memorable for me. <clears throat> um, this is the a game that the eight ball game I mentioned earlier that it was a um, convention about I'm going to talk about it in terms of art. This is what done in what we call classic style or conventional style of uh, screen printing which is with an, an outline, a black outline drawing that is then filled in with a m bunch of multiple layers of color, but much like t-shirts and sweatshirts and um, you know, uh, other kinds of garments are printed with, but they do it on glass. And again, you know, there's a lot, a lot of you in here know exactly what I'm talking about because a lot of people are in that business now of, do, of do, reproducing these things. But um, to me, it was kind of like a coloring book. You know, you have a black, art line, a black outline of the artwork and then you fill in the other colors with the screens uh, almost like a coloring book. The problem with it, with me, in my mind, was we couldn't do anything subtle. We couldn't do oil paintings. We couldn't do airbrush. We couldn't do things that were going on in the commercial art world at the time that um, reproduced uh, like air, you know, some of the more sophisticated illustration styles. So um, I became interested in trying to provide another way to do this, and I um, I contacted somebody. The guy came in, and we talked about doing four color process on on pinball glass. Four color process is nothing more than the way that um, magazine covers are done or uh, other, um, any kind of photographic process you see in print is usually, usually done with four color process, which just means it's four dots of color that are mixed together that give you all you know, millions of color. And um, so that we, we developed this, this process and, and I was doing it quite honestly just because of, as an artist I really wanted to have the um, the ability to do much wider variety of, of styles and, and, and use other uh, media rather than just a pen and ink and a standard um, back glass uh, screens. Um, but as it turns out, this piece right here is what um, our t little test piece for a game that's called Lost World. And this is what I presented to management after I gave them, showed them some pictures of, a, of an artist named Frank Frazetta who was doing some very cool sword and sorcery artwork at the time and said, I think we should do a piece of artwork like this, but I'd like to try to do it in this, with this new printing method. And you know, I'm, I'm this guy that just came in after one year of, of uh, after leaving teaching one year ago, I'm talking to them about changing the whole way that they're screening. And I think back on it now, and I tell you, I have no idea how I had the confidence to do that because it was, it was in a way crazy. But my motivation really was about, I thought it would just really enrich the artwork and give us a much better possibility for things. Um, the, the cost advantage to Bally wasn't even, I wasn't even considering that at the time, but it became really apparent to me later that it became a huge cost advantage. Anyway, long story short, we did the tests, we did some samples, we sent them out on tests just to see how they'd, uh, how they'd hold up, and, um, and then lo and behold, we created um, the first four color pinball glass, which is Lost World. And um, so this is a, a fairly elaborate acrylic painting with pen and ink on the border, and um, there's a, a lot of mixed media in there as well. Um, and it really, um, it, it caught people's attention. And uh, the funny thing about going back to the, the eight ball game, I had come up with this system all the time while I was working on eight ball, and they told me that we were, we're gonna go ahead with Lost World, we got this good game, you got the artwork to, uh, approved to do it, um, and I'm still working on eight ball, so I wanted to really get done with eight ball in a hurry to, um, to, get, to, to get, get over to work on eight, or on uh, Lost World. Um, 
the funny thing is, eight ball takes you know gets released as the first all electronic pinball machine, and you know hits breaks the records for sales and it was, has a very long run. So um, uh, I didn't get to. Um, I mean, it was it, it just was very surprising. It did as well as it did for me. Um, but the Lost World game did very well. Also made a big splash at the trade show that year. And then from then on, that's all we did was four color process. And today they use similar. Um, technique, but it's now it's a trans light and it's done with a litho press and just the more technical differences. But basically it's the same, same process. So um, this piece of art was, you know, is, although I'm, it's not my favorite piece of artwork, it's, it's one of my most memorable pieces for me because it was a huge change in the way the whole industry um, did their work. And, and for the most part, the, the industry did change to doing, doing this type of printing at that point. And this is, I think is 1978, I think, uh, if I remember right. Um, so it was, you know, I had only been there a year, and we set up, the, we did set up the art department. I became the art director, hired a bunch of artists, some of whom you've already seen. Greg Freres was one of them, uh, Kevin O'Connor, Margaret Hudson, Pat McMahon, Doug Watson. Um, we, we, I hired those people, and our art department grew to be um, really son, uh, something pretty special. Um, I have very fond memories of those days of working with those folks. Um, next one, um, Playboy Pinball, first Playboy Pinball, I think there's been three three versions now. Um, and uh, this one was, there's a little side story on this one was, I was given the assignment to do it, and again, it's only my, I did, I did an Evil Knievel, and I did a uh, Knight Rider game, and then was into um, the Lost World and, and eight ball um, games, and this was my next game. So I hadn't been, hadn't done a whole lot of games yet, but I, they gave me the assignment to do this, and I presented a very, I, I thought, a very impressive sketch that kind of um, suggested the whole Playboy lifestyle, the, the clubs, the, the hotels, the, um, just the, the magazine parts of it, but you know, certainly no nudity, very wholesome kind of a Playboy lifestyle um, image, and they sent it out to Hefner, and uh, he rejected it. And it was, it was kind of a crushing blow for me, and thought, oh boy, here's where it ends. Um, but he, he got on the phone with us, and said, no, 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 this, this is very, it's very cool for an ad for Playboy or something, Playboy lifestyle. Like, and he even said it was kind of a 60s style illustration, which is probably correct, because, um, but he wanted to be the man. He wanted to be the guy in the middle with the women on, this, on his arms, and, and he referred to uh, Captain Fantastic, which I think a lot of you maybe remember. It's a, with Elton John as the main character in the, in the glass, and he used that to kind of um, refer how he really wanted to see his artwork presented. Uh, his image presented, I should say. And so we came back, we actually, unfortunately we had to fly out there and talk to him in the mansion and, to, and, and it was a tough job. I mean, we had to go out three times, you know, just to get it right. Um, and my, I say we, it was Tom Neiman, who was the, the director of marketing for Bally at the time, and myself. And, um, but Hefner wanted to really be involved in the design of the game. Uh, he was getting flack from his his corporate people saying, we're, we're building a, a casino in Atlantic City, you don't want to even talk about it, but you want to talk about a pinball game, you know, and, and design it, but he did. He, so he, um, he, he brought down the girl that's on the right there to play the piano for us to, <clears throat> um, to get the Playboy jingle right. He, he's the one that named the grotto shot on the play field, and, um, and again, we, we did go back several times just to, because he really had, was a hands-on guy when it came to a, the pinball project. Um, I don't know how he was on the later two games, so um, I know that was kind of a memorable experience. And, and that he had just moved out to the California mansion, and it's, it is a beautiful place. And you know, it's not the seedy place you might expect. It was just gorgeous. And um, he took us on a tour uh, of, the, of the grounds, and um, we went down, saw all of the, the peacocks and monkeys and all the things he has around the premises. And it's on um, five acres. And then you go down to the tennis courts, and down there are two African African American gentlemen are playing tennis. And I look at them, and they look pretty familiar. And all of a sudden, Hefner says, "Hi, Bill. Hi, Jim." It was Bill Cosby and Jim Brown playing tennis on the tennis court. Um, now I, I do this talk sometimes to kids that I teach in high school, and my fear is when I mention the names in, um, I just mentioned that they won't know who I'm talking about. And, and it's almost at that point now. So, um, but Bill Cosby was there at this time. Of course, he's in the headlines for other things right now. But um, uh, anyway, moving on. But this, this game became a very successful game. Again, second electrum, or ele so, excuse me? Just a quick question, how did it go? Where did Grainy come from? Does anybody know? 
Anybody else read the magazine for just the articles? <laughs> uh, granny is Buck Brown's granny. She's a cartoon character that was a repeat character in many of the cartoons in the Playboy magazine. Um, so that, and he, and actually so is a little blonde girl, that her name is little Annie Fanny. Um, and again, these were just sort of characters that were, you know, I think uh, appropriately portrayed in, in good taste, but still uh, captured the, uh, the Playboy theme. The little um, Harlequin too, or, um, the, um, with the champagne bottle in the bucket, she's, she's from the, the joke page. It was on the back of the, uh, at least what I've heard, it was on the back of the, um, <laughs> the, the fold out. So um, anyway, so the, but this was a fun project. Obviously it was very successful, good playing game. Jim Patlow was a designer and uh, you know, a lot of fun to do. Okay, and this is um, the Hefner's game house on, on the uh, mansion, uh, in the mansion. Uh, it's actually a separate house out back by the grotto. And uh, there's the artwork on the, over the mantle there. So, and this was nice enough that Kevin O'Connor went out there when he worked on the second pl pl uh, Playboy game and um, took the picture for me and brought it back and gave it to me because it wasn't, obviously when I visited there, we didn't have it finished yet. Um, there are, there are a number of other stories about the Playboy game itself and, um, that I ramble on about sometimes, but I'm going to move on uh, for now, and then maybe we'll, if there's any questions later, I can t tell you a little bit more. Um, okay, this is um, one of my favorite games. Um, it's called Paragon, and as I saw one here at the show. Um, this was the first wide-body game that Bally made. Wide-body, actually, I think it was Atari that actually came out with the first wide-body format. Um, and they were getting, trying to get into the pinball market at that point. And um, so we came out with uh, Paragon. And it was sort of, the, the, the theme of the game was going to be sort of a um, sequel to Lost World in terms of characters. But in this case, I actually took a, another step where I literally made it my, my wife and I as the characters on the glass, you know. And believe it or not, that's how, well, my wife doesn't think that's how exactly how she looked, but she's still beautiful and um, was very, very great sport. And, and, and I was really into weightlifting at the time, so um, yeah, there's not, there's not that much fantasy involved there, but it, it uh, um, and I do have a lion at home, so, but, it's, but he's no longer with us, but uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, so this is, you know, again, one of my favorites, uh, and there's, there's stories that come up about Paragon, and I think, yeah, this is, now why, I'm jumping ahead, way ahead in the, uh, into, this was 2002, I think, if I remember right, and this is because I've had, people are always commenting about, asking me to see what the woman on Paragon looks like now. You know, and you know, it kind of creeps my wife out. But um, uh, so, but anyway, we, I agreed to send him a picture, and I did. And this is so that's my lo my lovely wife, and um, when she doesn't have her Paragon outfit on. Um, <laughs> so, um, okay. The, oh, I got to be careful. My my grandkids are here. My and my son and his beautiful wife are here. So, um, this is another game that that was a lot of fun to do. Greg Kamik, it's a designer. Great. Uh, this was a game called Xenon. Um, at Pinball Expo a couple of years ago, we had a um, Suzanne Chiani came into town. They had a whole deal on the on the, uh, the Xenon game. Um, the thing that was so impressive about this game, besides the play of the game, it had a tube that the ball was shot through. Um, we had uh, these kinds of games. Artists love to do because we create our own mythology, our own story for the game, our own. Um, and this this character was done 20 years before Avatar, or you know. And um, so I, you know, the, I, he, Jim. Um, the, uh, I can't remember the director now, but anyway, the director of Avatar was um, 20 years, uh, Cameron, Jim Cameron, right, yeah. Um, this, is, this is 20 years before he came up with his big-eyed blue, blue uh, creatures. So um, the, the, the fun about this game was it was also the first female talking game. I think Gorgar was the first talking game, but uh, this was the first female voice, and Suzanne Ciani did do the voice, and she's gone on to become you know, wonderful composer herself and just, just a great lady. And, but she did all those great sounds that are in the game that are sometimes are considered a little suggestive, but, um, but just very, just had a perfect voice for the game. So um, the game was a lot of fun. Um, the, the name Xenon just means that it's on the periodic charts, it's a gas, and somehow it sounded like it would be a cool name for a game. You know, you run that stuff by marketing, and they, oh yeah, that's good, that's good. Um, it was, so sometimes they, they left us pretty much alone and we just would, we, we, you know, we get a white wood to decorate and then have to get it, make it become ready for production. I, I love the game though, I love the artwork on it too, actually to be quite honest. And I put her back in the, in the poster um, for this year's uh, show here. 
Um, but this is how it looks with the Xenon logo in there, and then with the actual mirrors, reflective mirrors in the infinity back. This, that, this was the second game that used the infinity box. We did a Space Invaders game that had an infinity back box on it too, which gave it the illusion of great depth, and um, it was a lot of fun, kind of gave a lot of flash to the game, and uh, uh, really was a very a good attention getter, and that was kind of what we are always trying to do with art, is trying to get that first quarter, or whatever the, the uh, amount is now um, for the game. So that's Xenon. Um, this one I haven't showed before. This is actually the painting for Centaur. And it may look a little drab right now, and, and, it, and it is because I'm gonna show you a very bad photograph of, of the game itself, the back glass, how it looks. And if you've seen Centaur, it was in this sea of all these brightly colored games, we decided to come out with a, um, a black and white version of a game with a little bit of red accent to it. So that's what you're, not, what you're seeing there is the actual black and white painting. And then in the, in the actual game, it has, and this is like I said, it's kind of a poor version. I don't know why I used, I had a better shot and I didn't put it in, but um, this tells you how we just use some red in the, in the logo in the background. And then in the play field, it's predominantly black and white. And then has, I think, I don't, do we have one up here? I think we do, yeah. Um, the, um, the, the red was to, to give it enough color to have some, some pop, but, the uniqueness of it being all in neutral black and white tones was it made it stand out. So it was kind of a fun, and this is, I have this game. Jim Patla is a designer. Um, I, thought, I still think it's one of the best playing games I've ever played. Um, and I, so I really enjoy, enjoy this game. Um, or here, now there's some kind of side stories that come up. And I might, I might be a little bit out of chronological order at this point, but um, the Centaur, I think, though, was the last game I did for Bally if I remember, and, and then, I, went, then I, I branched off on into my own freelance career and started doing games for other people, and then later on in addition, in addition to Bally. Um, but the, uh, this one was a game called Grand Lizard, and I don't know how many back classes were actually produced. I think it's somewhere, maybe 20 is the, is the amount that I've heard. Um, this was for Williams. They came to me after I left Bally and was, was freelancing and asked me if I would do a game for them. The only provision was I had to do it in a month the entire package. It was a Python Angelou game. He came up with the name and the theme and they actually were gonna have a, a lizard on the play field, a molded lizard. So I had nothing to do with that part of the, the theme of it or the name, but I created the sort of the mythology around it and the characters for it, however we were gonna portray this, um, this grand lizard. Um, the, the, again, I'm, I'm gonna start giving some credit to the, 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 um, the, the, the person, the man hitting the, the uh, baboons um, there is uh, my son, who was at the time was an uh, all, all state wrestler himself and was an excellent, you know, get, just got a great body for a, um, a model for a, a muscular sort of, um, you know, heroic type character. Um, the green sort of lizard <laughs> lady up the top, I'm laughing because that's my daughter was my model and uh, she doesn't quite look like that, I promise. Um, you'll, you'll see here in a minute, um, I used her for some other things, and um, she, she was a fantastic model because she was beautiful, ballet dancer, perfect figure. Um, you know, just, just was the perfect model for, a, for a, either a pinball or anything where you wanted an attractive woman. Um, and she was very, it was a good sport to do all that for me. This game, though, was a, the, the, I did the play field, which is still exists on the game. Um, cabinet art got changed. I think Python got off of one of his jobs he was on originally and then went to uh, back to this project a little bit, and I'm not really sure what happened though, because they approved the backlash. The best thing is, um, or the most important thing is to me, is I got paid. Um, but they actually changed the backlash because they went with a new, the, what I was told was they were going to go with new displays for a, lar a larger display area. So it would have meant kind of re repainting the backlash or changing the black backlash considerably. Um, so they had Python do the actual released artwork on the game. Um, so this is, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's very few of these. If any of you have any of these glasses, there aren't many. Uh, and I, I have one and I have the, orig the original painting. Um, and it, it, but again, it, when you're a freelance artist, you, you know, you take the assignment, you, you try to get into as much as you can, you do what you can to finish it, and you hopefully you get paid, and that usually happens. Um, but then you never know what's gonna happen with the product. I've got some other pieces in here later that um, show games that were produced, the artwork was produced. Some even had all the playfield art <clears throat> and even cabinet art and then didn't get released. So that, you know, we don't have control over that as, a, as an artist. So um, anyway, so moving on. 
Um, again, here's Phantom of the Opera, one of, one of my favorite games, art-wise. Um, and the, actually, uh, this is the first game I did as a freelancer working, doing work for Data East and uh, Joe Kamenkow and Gary Stern. Um, <clears throat> and it's the, what I really liked about the game was that it, uh, Joe came up with the idea of the, the theme of the Phantom of the Opera, which is public domain, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was public domain, so there wouldn't have to be any royalties paid if I created my own version of Phantom of the Opera. Um, and so what he had me do, and I actually did appreciate the, the way he, he approached this, he said, read the book, and then do your version. He said, I don't care what it comes out like, I, I just want it to be your version of, of, of what, how you see Phantom. And uh, so I did, and, and, I, and I, it's an oil painting, it's one of the ones I have hanging in my studio, I still love the painting. Um, again, my daughter was my model for all the female uh, people in the in the picture, um, my um, sons and their one of them's going to see himself from uh, when he was I think a freshman in high school in a second. Uh, some of the the photographs I took, uh, the reference photographs. And the illustrators, we do a lot of things out of our head, but we like to have references so we get the sh shading right or we get the structure right. And and uh, so uh, you know, illustrators tend to take a lot of reference photos of things they're going to paint and then or or uh, manipulate in such a way that's um, the, the way they want it to come out. So uh, there's the, that's the original painting. That's the back glass. Um, some of you may have seen this. And the, the, this was kind of, a unique, kind of a unique kind of a back glass because we screened on the front surface for the mask and the hat on this part. Um, so when the, the game gets up to a certain frenzy level and you're really scoring well, there's a, um, and I forgot what, even what, the, what you have to do to get to the point where the organ starts playing and the lights behind the face start lighting up very brilliantly. And that makes the scary face of the phantom show through the, the mask. And so that was kind of the concept and the kind of the gimmick, if you want to call it a gimmick, uh, that we use for this. Um, these are uh, <laughs> the pictures of my uh, sons. Let's see, uh, both my sons the, the <laughs> and my daughter as the, in the pose for the, the, the uh, Christine Daae character. Um, my uh, son Todd is the one that's in the, on the left-hand side posing as a, a per, uh, the fellow that was um, hung in the, in the back catacombs of the Paris Museum the, in, in, in a white terry cloth bathrobe um, in the middle there with, a, with the unmasking of the f uh, phantom pose. Um, and he's down, he's down below that too with the terry cloth mask on when he's posing as a, when he was dressed up in the masquerade ball. And, and then the lower right-hand corner is my oldest son, the same guy that was in um, Grand Lizard. And uh, you can see how I kind of, kind of messed his face up pretty dramatically to make it look like the Phantom. But that was my, um, he was my, my um, reference for Phantom. And then here, here's some more. There's my uh, son Todd again up and, and that's actually a, um, a pose we use for Frankenstein, I think. But I know, oh, I sorry, take it back. He was, uh, that's on the play field of Phantom. Um, that's my oldest son in the middle with the mask that I created for the mask. Ed Sabula, who was actually the designer of um, Phantom um, and passed away, has since passed away, great guy. He was, became one of the uh, opera house owners on the play field. And uh, the, little, the guy in the Falcons jersey is no longer my daughter's boy, uh, girl, boyfriend, excuse me. Uh, but the fellow you may recognize in the middle with the white hair is uh, Gary Stern, and he was the other um, became the other owner of the opera house on the play field. So this is kind of what we would do as a rule. We didn't have digital cameras and we used Polaroids exclusively and to get our kind of references going. Um, okay. Okay, quick pick. This a, just shows a side of the cabinet of the Phantom of the Opera. Um, I always have to tell my, because I showed this to my students one time and they asked me, Mr. Ferris, do you have pants on? And um, I, and I assure you, I do. The, the little guy playing pinball is now 26, and he has just moved out of our house. He was my he's my nephew and lived with us up until about three weeks ago. So my wife and I are empty nesters for the first time in our life. Um, anyway, but that's the that shows you a good view of the cabinet, which I happen to think um, I happen to like a lot. Uh, this is again some other um, games that have I produced the um, paintings for. I just I haven't had these in the show before. Um, but I thought I would um, start adding them in. This was one of the, that this, I, this was the second game I did for Data East uh, at the time. This was Back to the Future. Um, and that, that, that sometimes people don't realize the stuff you have to go through when you have a license, but then the license isn't as exclusive as you'd like it to be. And in this case, 
Um, everybody was on board for Back to the Future in the license agreement except Michael J. Fox. He, he, I think the, what his management people were saying is that he didn't want to be known as Marty McFly the rest of his life and was concerned about kind of breaking into more serious roles and, and so he didn't want to you know, just be on it or, or the other possibility is he wanted to make, get more money for the deal and that's what happens a lot sometimes. But so what we did is we took, again, my, my sons have come to the rescue many times, so he stood in for, Mar, um, for uh, Michael J. Fox, and I, I painted him. And it's really, he it doesn't look like Michael J. Fox, but with the sunglasses and the bright light, it's not, you know, it's not really that apparent. But that is Doc Brown, the, the character uh, that, um, in the movie, that, that's the actor that played him. Um, so he was, fair, he was fine with it. So uh, this is um, the first Batman piece I did. This was for Data East at the time. Um, there's, there's actually several Batman games that have been done. This was the first one with Michael, Michael Keaton. Um, obviously Jack Nicholson and uh, Kim Basinger were the other three stars. Um, this, again, when, when you're, as an artist, you're dealing with uh, representations. You're not dealing with photographs. You're dealing with photographs they give you to represent in a painting. Um, it can be... Uh, challenging at times because they have certain images of how they want to be perceived uh, as opposed to how they actually look. Um, but in the, in the Michael uh, Keaton has very full lips and he wanted to have more of the comic book, uh, it wasn't really him, it was his, his management people wanted him to have a more of the square jaw, you know, uh, the comic book look to it, to his face. So I modified him a little bit, but, I, but it still became, stayed as Michael Keaton. Jack Nicholson, on the other hand, was thrilled with how he, he was painted and was very appreciative. So, you know, you don't, you know, some guys are just kind of cool about it and others are a little bit fussier. Um, this is a full acrylic painting, by the way. And all, all these paintings, just so you know, are done a little bit larger than the actual back glasses. So then when they were screen printed and, and reproduced, they were they tightened up a little bit when they were, the image was reduced a little bit. Okay, this is um, another one that had um, licensing issues. Um, everybody was really excited about having a hook. It sounded like a great idea. S Steven Spielberg you know, was, was directing it. Um, they took us out to the, um, the we got to go on the, the stage, the back lot, and see the, the sets where were incredible. They, they actually, at that time, were bringing in classes um, from schools of kids to come and tour the, the set because the set was, set was designed by a Broadway stage de uh, designer that was done in a different way than they usually do for a movie. So you were really virtually walking into the world of Hook when you walked onto the, the, the set, and, um, which is not typical of a movie set. Um, the only problem was at the, uh, Dustin Hoffman and uh, uh, Robin Williams, um, the two stars, did not want to um, give their likeness rights either. So it's not easy to tell, but that's Gary Stern as Hook, as uh, Captain Hook, and um, Joe Kamenko is the Peter Pan character. Um, again, done in a view where it's not real apparent, but truly they did model for this, and I, and I have the photos to prove it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, that was, uh, but it was great fun. This was a, a piece that was a lot of fun. I can't say the artwork was fun going through that kind of, because you always like to be able to represent what the movie really shows, but. Um, okay, now here I'm, <laughs> this is not a pinball game. This is just a reminder that during all this time um, that I was doing this artwork, and, and, and a lot of these require a lot of time, obviously. Um, but this is um, when I was coaching at college level. I was coaching at the Division III College at North Central College, and, and um, it just sort of reminds you that this is this other side of my life that was going on. So when I would work on a game, I would get, try to get up early enough, get done by three, zip over to the college and then wrestle for two hours and then come back and that was my workout. And even now I'm, I'm almost 69 and I'm still doing that, I'm still wrestling. Um, I don't know how much longer it's gonna last, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's sort of my, you know, my recreational activity and it's, uh, you know, I don't play golf. So I guess this is what, it, what I found to be very enjoyable. Um, <clears throat> There's gonna be another little presence of wrestling later on here. Okay, another couple games that I just recently stuck in. Um, this one was um, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles for Data East. Um, it's the only game I've ever been, uh, you know, there's always controversy about too, too much um, overt sexuality in games, you know, too, much, uh, too many of the, the themes directed toward a masculine audience. Um, and this one, and I gotta be sort of tactful the way I say this, but they, they made me change her anatomy twice, and it was for, uh, re, instead of reducing it, enlarging it. So, um, which has never happened. It was the, 
but it was the actual care guys who wrote the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the uh, Kevin, the Eastley, uh, uh, Eastley, and I forgot the other guy's name, but um, they um, they were the ones requesting it. So because they they kind of expected it to be kind of pinball art. So anyway, um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, all right, this one is one of my favorite pieces of art. It the movie was not a, a real successful movie. Um, but I happen to love the theme. I'm, um, even when I applied at Bally, to be honest with you, when I actually went in for my interview, I took in a couple of my landscape paintings to show them I was a legitimate artist, and also a booklet that I had created in eighth grade of monsters. And I mean, why I thought this was going to dazzle them, I have no idea. But, um, but uh, and I had some also had in that booklet. I also had. Um, some sports themes, so I could sh I basically show them I could draw pretty well even at that age, I guess was my thinking, but they were impressed somehow. And uh, so the, I have always been a person that loved to draw and paint uh, monsters. Uh, some people like to draw automobiles uh, as a kid, some people draw airplanes, uh, rocket ships, I drew monsters. You know, so, um, and that's why any kind of time I got a classic theme like this, I really loved doing it. Um, this was, uh, that's, if you don't recognize him in the makeup, that's Robert De Niro as the Frankenstein creature, and that's uh, Kenneth Branagh as the Dr. Frankenstein. Um, and this is kind of represents a little ev evolution of my own art style a little bit. I started using more airbrush as I got further along in um, the pinball art work, where initially I didn't use airbrush at all. Um, it's just, it's just a, kind of a natural evolution of art um, that happens when you, when you keep trying to you know, um, renew your, your approach to the, how you, you know, create these things. Um, but again, I, this is one that's hanging in my studio, and I happen to um, really am very pleased with the way it turned out. Uh, and this is the um, Pierce Brosnan GoldenEye game. Um, the story about this, and I, I, I haven't told too many of the anecdotal stories because I want to make sure we talk about the, 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 what I'm here to talk about, which is the artwork. <clears throat> but um, when we were at the Frankenstein premiere, Joe Kamenkow was there, and certain Gary Stern and a number of other folks from Data East, but, um, and I think at that time it might be, we might have been Sega Pinball, if I remember right. Uh, <clears throat> but we're in the lobby of the theater at Century City, and they've just had the, the red carpet showing of the, the premiere of the movie with all the movie stars, and we go in and eat popcorn with Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson and all these, all these people, which was kind of a real um, hoot. Uh, and then we went across the hall for, or across the street to the, uh, the hotel and then the big banquet um, party. And in the lobby, they had the um, Frankenstein pinballs set up. And we were playing them. And um, up walks Pierce Brosnan. And sa he says, he taps me on the show, he says, I never thought I'd see Bobby De Niro on a pinball machine. And, and then Joe Kamenko, who was not a shy person, um, jumped up and said, well, you're going to be on the next one. Because Pierce didn't even know. He had just gotten the James Bond role for the first movie. and they had just signed the deal, the license deal, to do GoldenEye. And he was, he was shocked and kind of he started laughing. He says, you know, I used to do this. And I said, well, you used to do what? He said, I used to be a commercial artist. I said, no way. And he said, yeah, he said, but I, you know, I couldn't make a living in it, so that's why I switched to acting. And, just, and the rest is history now. He's became, and he, he was a guy, I'll just share this with you. Um, he's a guy in person. The, the women that were in our entourage there um, were all, you know, we had Tom Cruise and a lot of pretty, you know, very famous actors and handsome guys and stuff. This is the guy that in person they all thought was, you know, knocked their socks off. He, he just, he's much more rugged in person, just a very, very cool guy. And uh, it was very fun to meet him. He since has sent me stuff um, just to kind of maintain some contact after we did the, the piece. But um, a very nice guy. And, and again, what we find out so, so often in, in, our, in the business of when you get artwork approved, you don't always deal with the, the actor or the, the artist themselves, but when you do get to meet the artist, they all, we all kind of have a similar respect for each other, and it's very cool. Uh, um, I remember walking into Matt Groening's office at 20th Century Fox when, we were, when Dadius was doing The Simpsons, we were getting the art approved, and I walk into his office, and he's got a uh, Phantom of the Opera pinball machine in his office. And I go, oh my gosh, you know, what? and then he walks over and they introduce me to him. Now he had just signed a multi-million dollar deal with 20th Century Fox for The Simpsons. And um, <clears throat> he, well, they walk over, introduce me to him and says, you're Paul Ferris? I says, oh man, you're a genius. Now this guy 
has just signed this huge deal, but this is just a cool, too cool guy who used to do doodles and, and, and made him into a you know, major um, animation. You know, well, it's all history now, but at the time, just very cool. He was even talking about how he used to, uh, within a, a year from that time, or before that time, uh, uh, he was looking in their sofa cushions to find enough quarters to put together to go buy a fat burger. That's how tough it was for him. So he had just had this huge um, success and, and just was a, you know, one of the nicest guys I'd ever met. So very cool. Moving on, this is the golden eye again with the um, same, same the back glass, but now with the, the logo stripped in. Um, this one, I, many times you do those now, you do them in the computer, of course, but in, in those, and even in this time, this is still 2000, maybe 1999, something like that. Um, yeah, I would, I'd painted the logo, I'd airbrushed it and did it, and then we'd drop it in, in the film, so that, so we have two pieces of artwork for this back glass. And, um, or here's a couple other ones now. Does anybody recognize this game? Wow, how to play? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm joking. Cause I know some people know the story. This, and again, I, this is the one with the logo in it. Um, this was a game, and uh, Tim Seckel was a designer at uh, Data East that was working on it. And it was conceptually it was uh, Joe's idea to try to combine two play fields with one um, back box and one back glass, and it got as far as. Um, approval with Schwarzenegger and um, I, forgot, I forgot what the company, who the company was that had the license rights at the time, because that's changed. Um, but um, we, so we did the the, the back glass. We, I did all the artwork for the playfield. Did a cabinet, did cabinet artwork, and um, game never got made. And and but again, I, I got paid, so that's important to note. Um, but I mean, it's just that's that's what I'm trying to say. Sometimes there are um, Jim, Jim Shelberg did a calendar this year with a lot of pieces that were either pieces that never got to, to market or were created as sketch ideas for um, future games or, and it was kind of a clever, very clever idea for a, ca a calendar theme. And uh, I sent him, I think the next one I have here, yes. I sent him, this was Batman Returns, which is a, <clears throat> the second Batman movie that Tim Burton directed. And uh, this one also never got made. Um, so, but the, the painting got finished. I, at this one, I don't think, I did, a, I did do a cabinet, but I don't think I finished the play field because the, for whatever reason, sometimes these license things are in negotiation many times, um, and then sometimes they fall apart or something else comes up that maybe it looks like a better deal. And, and when you're on the outside, all you know is what they tell you, and then um, you do the best you can to finish it as well as possible. And then if it gets made, great. If it doesn't, that's okay. I still have the painting. So, um, Okay, this is my last commercial pin, uh, pinball that I did for the movie Twister. Um, I just want to check my, okay. Um, this one um, was, was fun to do, the movie was fun. Uh, the, um, and I forgot the, the actor's name, uh, Bill um, Paxson, great guy. Um, the director, is, he got himself put in the picture, but Helen Hunt is the female actress that was on this one. And I, um, I tell the story, I just let you know kind of what our world is like when you're dealing with a license. It maybe isn't so bad now when you just use a photo, but when you're using photos that they approve and then you're painting the person, you're doing sort of your interpretation. Um, and then in this case, they kept, they rejected twice my, my, actually my tight drawing of her because her eyes were too squinty. Now, her eyes are squinty. I mean, all the photos we have, her eyes, and she's looking at tornadoes, you know, but she just has a kind of a, um, kind of smallish eyes. And um, so I had to kind of open her eyes more fully um, and the thing that, and I, you know, the thing I, I say about this, I notice now as I see her in um, recent years and not too long after this, she's clearly had plastic surgery on her eyes because she's no, they're, no, they're no longer squinty. So but who else would notice that unless you're drawing her eyes three or four times? You know? So um, anyway, this was a, a fun game uh, to do and it was, like I said, my last um, commercial pinball. Um, I'm, I put these pieces in, now this is gonna, I'm just gonna go and run through you very quickly because I, I may not even know all the names of all of them, but I did a lot of work um, also in video game uh, packaging design and artwork. Um, some actually on the, a lot of video game art itself on the, on the cabinets, not nearly as elaborate as most pinball art. Although there is one in here that I'm very happy with. I got to do a really, a pinball type package job. But this was um, the packaging art for a game called uh, Panic Restaurant. And the reason I have these in here is I, I, a collector contacted me last year and wanted to buy a bunch of these old paintings of package art that I had done. And I, and I have no idea, I had them in drawers, I had no idea what, if they're 
you know, I didn't know what their value was, but this one particularly was one he really wanted because I, I think the game was not particularly great, but some some reason it was a, he really wanted this one for a, um, it was a kind of a, a collector's piece for some reason. Anyway, it was a um, kind of a crazed um, chef in a kitchen called Panic Restaurant with, the, and the Japanese were not real thrilled with it initially because it was done for the Taito company was uh, out of Japan, but for the American market. Um, but then, the, um, they, because they, um, at the time, a lot of the games were very, you know, Mario Brother type, very simple pixel type, um, pr pretty, pretty uh, crude in the really early home game market. So uh, we were asked as artists to kind of give it a little bit more reality to the piece, and they thought I took it a little bit too far in terms of the, he looked like he's an insane um, chef instead of just a crazed chef, okay. But um, anyway, so there, there's the package and how it came out as Panic Restaurant. But now, it, like I said, it, it, it did find its, um, it did get some respect as in the collector's field. So uh, here's a couple other ones. And again, I, I, a Night Quest, I think, was the name of this game. And I, lo I love to do these things because sometimes they were for the package, sometimes they were for the uh, advertisement illustration we would do with it. And again, because the games themselves weren't that sophisticated, they wanted us to give it a much more rich, richer look but still represent what the game was about. And that was kind of a good time. Nowadays, the stuff they do on the games is virtually realistic, you know, so it's, um, it's a little bit different world. But uh, another one, I, I can't even remember the name, St. Cyr, I think is the name of that one. This was a game called Kadash, I think. I'm just gonna kind of go through these quickly, but it gives you an idea of some of the other stuff I got to do. I don't even remember the name of this. It looks like a silly game to me, but, um, but it, may be, it may be a big hit, so I don't know. Um, this is one I like, though, Chase HQ. I think this was Chase HQ. Um, all these are roughly you know, 24 by 18 size and then reduced down for the packaging size. Um, game called Toki, so <laughs> a little bit more of a humorous, um, semi-realistic cartoon approach. Um, game called Rampage. Guys at Midway, I think, designed that originally. Uh, uh, that's my son with a little bit more muscle on him and for a game called Power Blade. Um, that's my oldest son again. Um, and this just shows you the process of, and again, I'm trying to open the, the, pull the curtain back a little bit for what an artist does, especially these are all conventional paintings, but this is a sketch that was sent for a, a volleyball game. Um, and then um, what they came back and said, you know, we like it, but it, he looks too uh, angry uh, in the picture. So he wants something a little more, with a, still a, you know, the same exact um, pose, but just a little bit more friendly. So this is what I sent him. <laughs> And, and this is the game, so it came out. Uh, so it just, you know, sometimes you have to, you know, you, you gotta please what they're asking for. This was, this one had not just the American market that was advising, but the Japanese um, owners of the company had a lot to say too. So you're, you did have different, um, you know, different tastes and sometimes with some of these pieces. Um, this is a game I really liked doing. This was a game, it was a game from American Sammy. It was a video game arcade piece, but it came out after Mortal Kombat, but it was done with kind of the traditional raster type characters and kind of, you know, compared to Mortal Kombat, which came out with all these digitized, realistic characters, um, it, it, it suffered in terms of comparison. So what they asked me to do was create this, the most elaborate art package and realistic package I could to kind of make the packaging seem that much more, um, or make the game seem that even that much more uh, realistic, and I mean it was it was a good idea. And I'm, I appreciated it, but I'm not sure if it helped the, the game that much. But um, so anyway, this is a Frankenstein character that was in the game. Um, that and here's the painting of it. Now this is a that's about a four foot tall painting, and then of course it became a six foot tall cabinet side. So that's the full cabinet side on one side, and then the, the other one was the werewolf that was in the game. And I happen to really like these myself. I mean, I personally felt I really got a chance to kind of show my love of monsters and. Um, and kind of in, in ways that they hasn't really been done. Um, I've always objected to werewolves being brown fur because you know most wolves have gray, and so I, I created my own werewolf uh, version uh, back in the when I did these. Um, this was actually the last pinball game I did. It was done for um, Roger Duba um, and Chicago Gaming, um, but uh, it was a, based on a home game. It was for a home game. I think at the time they were sold through Costco, if I remember right. Um, but this has again my family is such such good sports. Um, that's my wife is in the passenger seat. My um, daughter uh, is in the back seat. Uh, no, excuse me, that's, my daughter is out the window on the left. She's the one that was in uh, Phantom of the Opera. And then my two of my grandkids, um, Kagan and Akena, are in the back and we, they had, she hadn't had her third one yet at that point. 
Uh, on top of the roof is the little baby that was playing the pinball back with Phantom of the Opera. That's him at a little, a little older age. And I think this was maybe uh, 2002, I'm thinking, is when this was done, if I remember right. Um, and again, just a couple quick things, other things I've done through um, uh, redemption games and other things. So I wasn't, when I wasn't doing pinball art, it wasn't, I wasn't doing art, I was doing other things. Um, and again, it, it's always good to have a little diversity uh, in, in your um, client base uh, in terms of when, when things go a little slow, you need to have some other things going on. But I happen to enjoy doing several of these pieces. This was a theme for a kind of a video ride game that I got to do. You had three different lands you traveled to. Um, this one was, everybody knows, I, a lot of people here know Roger Sharp. This is a game he did in conjunction with Bromley. It was a redemption game and it was based on the Muppets 25th anniversary um, of their existence. And um, so uh, you know, Roger and I got to work together on a game, which didn't happen too often, but um, a really, really good guy and obviously has a wealth of great stories from the pinball world. Um, okay. Another little commercial for wrestling, sorry about this. The, uh, the guy in the left-hand corner, lower left-hand corner, is my grandson. This happened actually last winter. Um, was, became the state champion wrestler for uh, Montini in, in, in Illinois. Um, and I have a couple other pictures to go with it. Again, this is, I was still coaching wrestling at this time. Um, this is him right after he wins his um, state championship. He did a backflip, he did the double biceps pose, and then, um, rushes over and my, my granddaughter is the photographer who was on the floor taking these pictures and it, this, this is, uh, I may get choked up when I even talk about it, one of the, uh, my favorite moments uh, in, in one of my favorite moments of my life. This was just terrific. I got him convinced to wrestle when he was nine years old and this was the uh, outcome of his senior year so it was a pretty special moment uh, for me. Um, so I share that with you just because it, this is again this thread of wrestling that's gone through my life. All right. This is moving ahead to what the poster we did today. I'm going to go through this quickly. The original idea was actually I was doing a, um, a t-shirt, one of the ideas for a t-shirt for Expo originally. And there wasn't going to be time to do that. Um, then they, when the guys from this show contacted me, we talked about maybe doing it, um, using this idea as a theme for this year's poster. So um, this was the rough sketch of the, how we're going to change it. And it actually went through some modifications just because um, the arcade game um, thing changed it from being more, much more pinball dominated than having uh, both pinball and arcade games. So there's kind of the uh, little manip just a kind of a rough sketch pa pasted together to give them an idea how it's going to go. Um, this is the game I showed them that when they talked about having the video game in there, this is the zombie raid game that had the Frankenstein character on the side and I said I could use that game as a video game and I have a, a good photographs of it so we decided we'd use that. Um, this is the kind of the rough pencil sketch of the process. Um, and then this is, a, again, another version of the, with the text in there. Um, I think the dates are wrong on this time, at this time. But, and then this is when I revised the Xenon face a little bit just to make her, I, I, in my mind, I wanted to kind of give her a little more current look. I don't know what I was thinking necessarily, but I, want, you don't want to, I just didn't want to do a cut and paste. I did a full painting for this poster. So I wanted to really kind of recreate all the, all the people in the, or all the characters in the poster. Um, so here it is before it um, gets painted. That's sort of the pencil sketch that goes on the, the background. And then here it is. Um, that's the final version without the video game in it. And so the, what, what turned out, they wanted to make the video game larger in proportion to the pinball. So we, um, the werewolf we had to go bye-bye. Um, this is the process of what it looks like when you have to change. Photoshop makes it easier. This is not Photoshop, this is a painting. So it, you know, it, it uh, was a little different process. Um, but here it is now with the, um, the, the video game in it. With them. We wanted to keep the, the kick bumper in there, um, thumper bumper um, up at the top there. And, and this is what became the final poster. So um, that's, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of rushing through this now so we get a little time for quick. This is a quick look at my studio. Uh, this is where, you know, I sometimes call it my one-room apartment because it's in my home, but I, I hardly ever leave it. So it's a, but it's a pretty comfortable place to work. Um, this is some of the other stuff I'm doing. That's a mural piece that's being worked on right now. Um, it's a pretty messy studio. I know it. I know it. Um, but uh, there's some of my paintings on the wall. Um, again, the other side of the studio. Um, my computer area with my... Uh, Cintiq, which, which is a wonderful instrument. Um, I didn't put the light sign in the TV intentionally. That was just what was on TV at the time. I, um, again, this is a very quick thing, uh, what I've, some things I've done recently. Why do I have 
um, Ben Stiller, right? Yeah, Ben Stiller. Ben Stiller in, in a piece about a mural because he was my inspiration for the pose of my, this mural I was doing. So I used that pose of him to create, and I made, then I sculpted it in, in clay to get it so I can get the correct shadows. And then what this became is a mural. Well, I did two of these, and 800 square feet of mural I just did in October um, for a high school. Um, and so this is just a process of this going through um, the whole process. That's the one in the field house. You get an idea, those are doors, those green things at the bottom are doors, so it gives you an idea how large these are. Um, there's, there's just the process of building the mural. For the, this was the field house, and that's me signing it down there in the bottom right-hand corner. If you can see, so that's, it was, a, it was probably, the, yeah, it was definitely bigger than a pinball machine, and uh, one of the biggest things I've done, but it was a lot of fun. Um, this is the, the gym before I painted the gym. I painted all that area now, this is the process, beginning of the, the mural. Um, this is actually, this painting right here, which is almost embarrassing for me to say this, but I painted that with an airbrush in three hours, and that's huge. And, but the, the project took a month. So, I mean, it just shows you how much more time it took to, to do the logo and to do all the fur on the, on the Wildcat, because this is the way, kind of the way it's, it's supposed to look in, in process. And then, then this is the, um, near the end, and then, I'm gonna jump ahead. There it is, I think that's the last piece. Oh, here, there's the last piece of the, of the mural. So, um, anyway, that is um, a little tour of um, pinball, but plus a little um, added um, reflection of what I'm doing right now. Um, I would like to open it up if anybody has any questions at this time. Yeah. Many times, yeah, when it wasn't a licensed game, yeah. Right, so like, what, what is your favorite or off the top of your head, a memorable one you can think of for one of your creations? And then the second one, just about your, you seem to get a lot of jobs, a lot of gigs going. Between, uh, <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> All right, that's a great question, and I, I and just you know, knock on wood, I um, I've never had a rep, um, which is what in, in the commercial art world it's it's usually better if somebody reps for you because we don't do a great job for ourselves usually. You know, it's not easy to I could talk if you did artwork I could come and I could sell your work, artwork like crazy, sell my own harder. You know, because it it's just very personal, so it's usually good to have somebody do it. I've just been very fortunate. Um, I've had great people that I worked with. Um, pretty good results with a lot of the pieces, but um, I, I just, I feel I was given such a gift to be part of this industry for one, when some people used to make, kind of make fun of it when they heard I was doing pinball art. But there's nothing, um, nothing to ridicule about this industry in terms of the quality of the art and stuff I got to do. I, I walk into Paris, into a bistro in Paris and see a Playboy game with my artwork on it, right? You know, there's just something very rewarding about that. Um, so I, yeah, I've been very fortunate. Um, and again, the thing I'm really fortunate is I have not damaged my hands or my um, any part of my body in wrestling. <laughs> so I've been able to continue because I just that's another one of my uh, passions, as I said. Question. Yes, it was uh, understood, yes. Okay. And, uh, and then, um, depending on who you worked with, but um, um, Gary Stern used to want me to um, give him the originals, but then if, if, the, if the price got really much higher because of that, then it was, it was easier to negotiate that I kept them. So uh, <laughs> I'd say that kid, I, Gary uh, is a longtime friend, and we used to go on cruises together and stuff. But yeah, he was, he's, he's a tough negotiator on that kind. But uh, yeah, I, I, that was just an expectation. I still try to do that, anything I do, because um, they would get the reproduction rice, and, and, you know, as long as they wanted it. But um, but I would keep the original paintings, and I still have virtually all of them. I think there's only two: the Playboy one I did sell, and um, Joe Kamenko has a game called Checkpoint. That I, I, I just gave that to him as a gift. Yeah. Um, your question about the mythology one, going back to that a second though, um, I think the one I would find a lot of fun to do and revisit if I had a chance would be Paragon. I love that, the sword and sorcery kind of thing. I'm a big fan of Game of Thrones, you know, which is a huge hit on television right now. Um, so that theme of, would be great. Um, Xenon was kind of fun because it was so different you know, uh, at the time. Um, but it, the thing was, and Greg Freyros was talking about this earlier too, when you get to kind of create 
not just the artwork where you're doing somebody else's wrist work of, that's already been created, where you're kind of coming up, and many times it's with the designer. Um, because they have to know how, you know, why do you have this shot here? Well, it's going to be a, you know, a weapon or it's going to be something else or however you want to um, interpret it. And, and the designer has a lot to say about that. Um, I didn't get to work as much, in, I worked more independently when I was a freelancer, but I would go in to, to Data East or and, and a lot of those guys I'd worked with before when I was at Bally. So um, it was, it was, you know, every one of them had their own uh, special quality. So they were very receptive to, um, Usually, most of my ideas. You know, so it was not. It was a fun collaboration. Anybody else have? Uh, hey, sir. Um, back in the uh, EM days, there were, there were a few games there where people aren't quite sure who the who the artist was. Yes. Who worked on them? Um, but it, it seems that you've always signed all your artwork. Is is that something that have you have you always signed? Yes. Yeah. When did that start? Okay, and this is my version of the story. Somebody may have something different. Um, when I started, first of all, when I started there, I was. I was I was brought, started at Bally. Um, I was brought up with, them, with um, the idea of illustrators signing their work. That was Norman Rockwell, if you think of some of the, some of the famous. So I just thought that's what our illustrators are supposed to do. And the first game I actually signed, actually in the Evil Knievel, I kind of um, sneaked it into the, um, the, the gas tank where it said Ferris Gaten, because Gary Gaten was a designer. And that was sort of a way to do it. But then the next, I, think the, I think it was Lost World, if I remember right, was the first one I just blatantly signed. And they weren't real comfortable at Bally at that, at, with that at that time because, and I get it, they were saying, you know, that, well, the designer did a lot of work on this, you know, why shouldn't they sign it? And then what that evolved, and I said, yeah, but they didn't do the back glass artwork. So that's kind of how I, and they were very gracious about it. And then all the other artists started to do it. And most artists do it. If you notice now, most of them do it. So, I'll, you know, I'll take credit for taking some of the heat early. Um, but it was, I just think it's kind of nice to know. And then people come up and say, I, you know, they'll look for my name. And say, I, I know you. I know that was one of your pieces of work, or Greg Ferris. Uh, Greg Ferris is an interesting deal because I, I hired Greg, and I, you know, we got to the interview. Great guy, great young man. This guy's going to be great. He knows how to work a camera. He can do that, and we can also get him to start to do some artwork. And I said, but Greg, there's one problem. He says, What are we going to do about your name? There's going to be some confusion. And he said, Well, we'll just have to deal with it. And, and obviously, he's you know carved his own path you know, beautifully. So, um, but um, but yeah, the, the signing was originally. A little bit more tentative, and just and then with the Lost World because I really did feel Lost World was my baby. I mean, if that thing had flopped, and I, I, I changed every, the whole way we were printing things, and, and we they invested in the equipment, and you know if that had gone down, it would have been you know I'd have been back teaching or hopefully or who knows what, <laughs> but um, yeah. So there is time for one more. Question. Okay. Are you going on? Is anybody supposed to you about doing uh, pinball games for for part of the company? Has anybody talked to me yet? No, yeah. um, not that I'm sure of. Uh, you know, but I, um, <laughs> I, you know, because I mean, at these events, people are talking all the time, and I, and I, um, I, I, I would say right now, I'd be very open to doing more artwork in a commercial because I am no longer teaching. Retiring from teaching, when I when I was teaching and coaching, um, that took a lot of time. I had this delusion I could do ten pieces of art in addition to teaching, and I was just wrong. You know, it just not the level I like to do it, and not the level I taught. But my kids, in terms of their performance, the students I had won national awards every year, the year since the year I started teaching at the, the Lincoln Way schools when I was there. Um, so they, they, these kids do phenomenal work. And it was like, it's one of the most rewarding jobs I've ever had. This was exciting and has a lot of benefits. There's nothing like teaching a kid to do some artwork and show them sort of the magic tricks and then watch them do the magic. It is unbelievably rewarding, and I would do it forever, you know, but, but at the time, it was just, now it was time to, to get on, but it was just a, uh, yeah, um, uh, the teaching part was really rewarding. You had a question, so I'm going to take your question. Yeah, I was asking about, I was wanted to ask about the uh, biker chick on the centaur, uh, the back story of that, and have you seen her recently? No, haven't seen her recently. True story, she was a former student, and, um, but she, I ran into her, I think it was, um, maybe six or seven years, because uh, it depends on the, the year, but I think it was about six or seven years since she, when she graduated, and she wanted to be on a pinball game. And I, The first one I had was a former student in a game called um, Knight Rider, which is a truck driver game, and there's a waitress on there serving coffee to the truck driver, which I got sort of got some flack about because it was a, it was a woman in a subservient role to a man, is what I was, we were told and originally. And I, um, so at that time, I, you know, she it just was a friendly waitress. You know, I used to actually drive a truck and remember when some of the waitresses would come over and be very friendly, and, and that was. And that, but the girl, the girl from Centaur, no, she did. Um, 
she, um, again, she wasn't dressed like she is in the um, picture when I took the picture, but, uh, and again, I, I, had, I did have people that wanted to get into pinball machines and said, well, can you put me in one of your games? And my brother is on the game of F Future Spa. Um, I'm trying to think, of my, my, you know, my kids have been on my game so many times, it's probably, um, I, I can't ever repay them enough. But, um, uh, but yeah, the, um, and I, I get, we got a little flack on Centaur too. I, they were telling me it was all, you know, all this uh, S&M, um, you know, kind of, believe me, I didn't know what that was. <laughs> It's, I just thought black and white pinball game. I'm thinking of Harley Davidson leather jackets, and that's kind of what the theme is. So this is, uh, I, you know, it's embarrassing a little bit to say that's that's how naive I was. But uh, uh, anyway, so that the, 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 I have not seen her. Okay, anybody uh, last quick ones or anything? Okay, yeah. No, it's not exclusively, but um, primarily. yeah, primarily. Although now you can do. So I showed you that, that Cintiq tablet, which is, if anybody knows anything about the graphic design business, that's a tablet where you can do almost replicate any kind of painting style at all. I like the traditional painting style best. It's, it's messier and it takes longer, but, the, but I also use the Photoshop um, and the Cintiq as well to create those nowadays, because it's just another tool. You know? And I've talked to Greg Ferris about it too, and he's done that. He was a traditional guy in the beginning too. All, all of us were, but you have to adapt to what the, the tools are. You know? It does make it tough though, because now everybody assumes if it's done in Photoshop, you can do, you know, you can do cut and paste, cut and paste, move it around, and it's all done very quickly. And it's when it's a painting, it's not quite that easy. So, uh, well, I, I just want to say um, thank you all for being such a, a great audience. I hope it's been a little bit of a reflection, at least on my past and what I've done. Um, this is a terrific show. The people here have been just so gracious. Uh, I can't uh, thank them enough, and and for for doing these kinds of things. It's it's exciting to hear how this pinball thing is still th thriving, so yeah, thanks again.